We're going to talk about a, a section of Matthew's gospel today. It's Matthew 11, 16 to 30. And Jesus is talking about people and the different responses and how they respond to him uh, in these villages that he's been basing his ministry out for three and a half years. And um, there's not always a lot of interest. It's about the same level as this. Uh, I don't know how many of you walk in Costco at different points in time, but if you are a Costco person, or if not, let me set the stage for you. As you walk into Costco, first of all, you see all the big ticket items that they want you to purchase, like the TVs and all the stuff, all the eye candies right there, right? All the sales. And then as soon as you pass that, there's a booth where there are people always there, and they're trying to sell you cell phone plans or cheaper internet plans or a Traeger grill system, a wood pellet grill some certain times of the year, or other things uh, that you obviously really, really need to have, uh, high-quality blenders and things such, such, such nature. And so there are always people, and you've got to walk through the gate of all the salespeople, right? And so at first when I would go to Costco, I was trying to be polite, and I would engage people. I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? And then they would go into their spiel, and I'm there for like the next two or three minutes listening to a spiel about something that I'm not really interested in. And so then as time went on, I would start looking the other direction as I walked past, you know, and they would still try to talk with me, right? And then I would go a little bit faster with the cart, like I'm a man on a mission, you know, and I'm here for one thing at Costco, which of course is realistic, right? And after a while, I found myself rerouting. I would go the long way around just so I didn't have to walk past the people that were going to try to sell me something because I was disinterested. And after a while, believe it or not, a lot of people started to treat Jesus in very similar ways because he was doing these miracles and he was doing this teaching, but it just wasn't something that they were interested in. God in the flesh is here in the town, in the city. He's based out of there. You can see him, you know, on a daily basis if you want to, but they really, they don't want to. So Jesus is going to address those types of people because as he sent his disciples out, his, his 12, into other cities to share about himself and to teach and other things and to do miracles and help people, uh, Jesus himself is staying back kind of around base camp, three different towns where most of his 12 disciples were from, and he's just kind of hanging out in those communities, also teaching and healing and doing those same things. And he's going to reflect on how people are responding and how people are not responding to him. And it's interesting because most people who encounter Jesus' messages and miracles, you think that they would fall at his feet and go, wow, here's God, look at all these amazing things happening. But most people are either complacent, they're just apathetic, they could care less, they're not interested, or they're actually critical and they're criticizing Jesus uh, and they're kind of attacking him. And Jesus responds to this in verse 16. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 11, and we have the verses on the screen behind me this morning as well if you want to follow along. But Jesus says, to what should I compare this generation, these people in these towns around me? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, like a mourning song, but you didn't mourn. And people would wail and mourn at funerals. And so you can, you can get into the mind of a child in this, right? Jesus is talking about pretend games, not pretending to be monkeys, but pretending to do similar things. Kids are in the markets and they're bored, and so what do kids do? They start to play and they start to pretend. And they're pretending like they're playing the flute for other kids, and guess what? And maybe for adults. And some of those kids might just jump right in and start dancing to the flute music, but you know what? Probably the older they get, the less interested they become, right? I don't want to play those kid games anymore. Or maybe they're a little self-conscious and they think, well, I don't want to act like an idiot. I don't want to make a fool of myself dancing in the marketplace to this child playing an imaginary flute. Or they're, they're singing lament songs, wailing songs to mourn the dead because they're just playing, you know, what they see out in society. And they expect other kids and other adults to, ah, this is terrible, start mourning as they're doing this lament song and nobody's reacting, nobody's responding. Or they ask you to act like a monkey in the middle of a church service and swing on vines and eat bananas and play in the water and drink it and run from the fake line on the screen. And you're like, you know what? I've been too old for this for decades. There was a time when I was maybe three or four years old when, Jason, I might have been on board with you and I might have joined in with you. But right now, I'm more civilized. You know, I've grown past that. I'm too mature to play your kid games, your pretend games. And a lot of people imported that same viewpoint in toward Jesus. Jesus... Uh, I don't want to make a fool of myself by associating with you 
or I've moved past this. Some people are too concerned with what other people will think about them if they follow Jesus. And other people just have a lot more important interests, you know. I see some of these people chasing this Jesus figure, but you know what? I've got a life. I've got a job and a family and work and other commitment and other priorities. Why would I go out and hear this interesting, you know, yeah, sure, he draws attention, but this kind of strange guy Jesus teaching in these villages. I've got more important things. And maybe they see what Jesus is saying. I mean, he's talking about this kingdom that God has that's now upon them. And they're like, this guy, uh, he is... He is following this imaginary thing. He's got something in his head and, you know, I'm not quite on board or it doesn't seem relevant to me. And for all these different reasons, like a child playing a game and the people that just don't want to get involved, most people when they see Jesus, they think he's just playing some sort of game and they don't want to get involved with him. And that's how he summarizes people's reactions. And then there's other people who, instead of just staying at an arm's length and saying, I don't really want to get involved, I'm not interested, Jesus, they're actually really critical and they're quick to condemn. In verse 18 and 19, Jesus talks about these people. He says, John, this is John the Baptist, this is Jesus' relative, the one who was baptizing out in the desert. And John had kind of an eclectic lifestyle. He was a prophet of God, so he, he dressed in camel's hair clothes, which were very, uh, you know, rough clothing. It wasn't refined clothing at all. And he ate what he could find in the desert, primarily locusts and wild honey. So he was kind of this eccentric character who lived a very simplistic life, you know, almost an ascetic type life. And then there's Jesus. And when Jesus comes, he is socializing with all kinds of people, literally every kind of person, the religious people, the non-religious people, and even uh, the tax collectors and sinners. The tax collectors were seen by the Jews as sort of betraying the Jewish nation because they were working to collect taxes for the Roman Empire. And sinners included people like prostitutes or very non-religious people, people who had lifestyles that Jewish people simply did not associate with because they, they wrote those people off as like, you know, you're, you're a bad person. And yet Jesus is socializing with them, not only socializing, but he would have meals with them and he was invited to banquets with them and he would eat, you know, some of these banquets were nice because people had means and and so they would have lots of fancy food sometimes or even wine at the banquets. Um, And so Jesus is here maybe with a glass of wine and some food from the buffet spread at the banquet sitting across from people who are tax collectors and people who had bad reputations in the town and just talking with them. And people became very critical. Uh, John didn't come, Jesus says, eating and drinking. He didn't come eating and drinking normal food. (laughs) Locusts and wild honey are not normal food, right? And so people would say, John's got a demon. He must be possessed because he's acting like that. And then Jesus comes in a completely opposite manner. You know, he's feasting and all these things with people. He came eating and drinking and everybody says, look, he's a glutton. He's, you know, he's stuffing himself with food and he's a drunkard. Look at that glass of wine. He probably gets drunk every day. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners, the people that no one should associate with. And so they're very critical. So some people, on the one hand, respond very critically to Jesus. Other people are just complacent. They could care less. And maybe we see these similar responses today in our society as well. And Jesus is going to address this and the seriousness of it and also what these people are missing out on by thinking he's just trying to facilitate some sort of a pretend religious game. Both of these groups, though, they're concentrating on their own perceptions. Uh, The people that think Jesus, you know, is just playing a game, you know, they they see Jesus as kind of irrelevant. Um, And then the people who are being critical, you know, they're focused on Jesus, but they're not focused on their own critical spirit. And so most of these people, they're looking at perceptions uh, and they're kind of judging Jesus without knowing his true motive. And so Jesus has this next statement. And I want to tell you up front, I don't know exactly what this means. Because God is big, and the Bible has a lot of things in it, and you read them and you think, what in the world is, is this person talking about? Here's what Jesus says. After talking about the ways people are responding, he says, Yet wisdom is vindicated or proven to be right by her works or by her deeds. Wisdom is proven right by her deeds. What are you talking about, Jesus? What does that mean? I'm going to give you my best guess, but I might not be right. So just a caveat there. In the, in the book of James in the New Testament, James talks about wisdom. And one of the things he says about wisdom, he says wisdom from above or heavenly wisdom is pure and peace-loving and gentle and compliant and full of mercy and good fruits. It doesn't show favoritism. It's not hypocritical. 
And so it seems like James and other people in the Bible, when they talk about wisdom, it's not necessarily what action is wise, it's how you go about it, you know, oftentimes that contributes wisdom. And so as you're doing something, is it pure? Is it of good motive? Is it going to promote peace? Is it being gentle toward people? Is it merciful? Does it show favoritism? Is it hypocritical? You know, you've got to look at the motive. You have to look a little bit deeper. And I think what Jesus might be saying here is if we truly want to know whether or not an action is wise, we need to consider how it's approached by somebody. You know, is it gentle? Is it critical? Is it harsh? Is it peace-loving? How is the approach? And also, what's the motive? And the tricky thing about that is a lot of times we don't know what someone else's motive is. And for example, I think Jesus is applying that to what they thought about John the Baptist and about his different eating habits. You know, if you want to know whether or not it's wise to live in the desert and eat locusts and wild honey, you need to see how John's going about it and what the purpose is and what his motive is. And if you are going to criticize Jesus for socializing with all these people over food and wine, you really need to know what is Jesus' motive and how is Jesus approaching the people, right? Right? And I think that's a good bit of truth for us, even if that's not exactly what Jesus meant, just to take that principle and to kind of uh, look at it. It's thought-provoking, because I think it's easy for all of us to judge people based on our own perceptions. And people misjudge Jesus based on the way that they saw him, the way Jesus appeared to them. And it's easy for us to do the same thing. So instead, maybe it's more important that we look, when we see something that's questionable that someone is doing that maybe we wouldn't do ourselves, to look a little bit deeper and say, well, how are they approaching that? Is it in kindness? And what's motivating them? And to get that answer, you'll actually have to have a conversation with the person and say, you know, I noticed that you are approaching things this way. Can you tell me why? Because oftentimes when we clarify why we're doing things one way, um, other people realize and they learn, you know, I shouldn't have been critical for that of that in the first place. And so Jesus is getting a little bit into motive there. Um, but he's saying... Um, Essentially, if you're going to be disinterested, you know, make sure you're being disinterested for the right kinds of reasons, not with the wrong motives. The next thing Jesus is going to challenge people to is to reevaluate um, kind of where this road is leading them. They are not interested in Jesus. They don't really want a lot to do with him. They're not responsive at all. And so by not responding to Jesus, how does this play out over time, over a lifetime and even over an eternity? Where does it take you to when you don't respond to Jesus and you think he's playing kids' games? In verse 20, it says, Then he, uh, Jesus, proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because people didn't repent. Repent just means think differently. They didn't embrace Jesus' teachings. And he says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Chorazin and Bethsaida were two towns, and I'll show you where they're at on a map in just a moment. Woe sounds like a crazy word, right? Like a word of judgment, but it's actually a word of sorrow. So when Jesus says, woe to you towns, he's looking into the future and seeing what the fate of these people is who have rejected him. And he's grieving over their future fate is what he's doing. The people who inhabit these towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and we'll see Capernaum in a moment, which is where Jesus' ministry is based out of. Here's a map that I want to show you. So this is current day map. It's Google Maps, obviously. So we're not, we're not in the, the first century here. We're in the 21st century. However, on this map, you'll see the uh, kind of the tree symbols. They have the little map symbol and have a tree on them for national parks. In the bottom, close, this is the Sea of Galilee to the south. So uh, we're in northern Israel, right on the north coast of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus' ministry uh, was centered on. Capernaum, right in the middle of the map, is Jesus' hometown for this period of ministry. Um, Bethsaida is the green, the dark green spot that's now a, nas- uh, a national park, a reserve, up in the upper right corner of the map. That's the location of Bethsaida uh, in Jesus' day. And then if you look up to the uh, left side of the screen, you see Chorazim, Chorazim National Park and Chorazim. That is where Chorazim is located. So all these towns are within two or three miles of each other. This is where Jesus' hub is. And these are the towns that are, you know, resisting him, even though they've seen the most of what Jesus has been involved in doing. And he's saying, I grieve your fate. Why? Next, Jesus says in verse 21, for if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, we'll talk about what happened in Tyre and Sidon in a moment, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes a long time ago. 
So if they saw what you're seeing, they would have come back to God in a heartbeat. But I tell you, it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. So Jesus is again grieving what's going to happen when these inhabitants of these towns that didn't respond to him stand before God in judgment one day. Skipping up to verse 24, he says, I tell you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Now, if we go back to our Old Testament and you've heard the name of Sodom somewhere before, their guilt, Jesus is saying, is greater than that of Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. Because What they're seeing is God's power with their own eyes, and they're still rejecting him. They're seeing Jesus as God in the flesh in their midst, and they're rejecting him. And so Jesus says, you'll be held even to a higher accountability than people from these towns that you would consider to be very wicked places that you've heard of in your history. I want to give a little bit of background on these other cities. Tyre and Sidon... uh, Isaiah describes them in the Old Testament. And the way that they're described is a town that's prostituted themselves to every type of worldly pleasure. So anything out there that you can have experience by just for yourself, self-gratification, they're all about that. They were right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and so they had uh, a lot of wealth from trade routes that came right into ports in Tyre and Sidon. So they had ridiculous amounts of money and resources that could fuel everything their heart desired. So just let your imagination run wild, and you'll get a few ideas of what they were about, perhaps. And eventually, God, through Isaiah and some other prophets in the Old Testament, said, you're going to be destroyed, your cities are, because of the way that you're living. But then you're going to come back again, and they did in the Roman Empire. But they were destroyed by Persia and Greece in ancient history, and the Jews knew that. That was their fate. In the city of Sodom, things got even more dark because the men of Sodom, what they would do is they would form mobs to sexually assault its male visitors, and they were destroyed eventually by burning sulfur, burning resin that God dropped out of heaven on the cities. And so, again... The men of the town form mobs to sexually assault all the male visitors who come into town. So violence, I mean, about, you know, what you can imagine type thing. They push the envelope of the way that they dishonored people and humanity. In their culture, it was one of the most outrageous, humiliating, imaginable things in the ancient Near Eastern culture. No matter whether you were a follower of the God of Israel or not, people, that was not hospitality. And the East is still very big on hospitality today, and this violated all the rules of hospitality in a deep way. And so for Jesus to say, your judgment, these towns of people who just ignored Jesus, your judgment is worse than that of Sodom and Tyre and Sidon, that was making a huge statement. And Jesus, he says in verse 23, and you, Capernaum, this third city, uh, will you be exalted to heaven? So maybe you think you're a little better than Chorazim and Bethsaida because that's where my, that's where my location, I've been, I've been living there and sleeping there at night. Will you be exalted to heaven? He says, you will go down to Hades for if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. So Sodom would have repented if they saw what you were seeing done in that city. So he says, if, if you stay unresponsive, your fate is going to be ultimately to end up in Hades instead of in heaven. And just to give you a little background on Hades, Hades was a Greek term, and it was the, kind of the realm of the dead. But Hades was considered to be a dark and dismal place in the depths of the earth where departed spirits arrive. So a person dies, their spirit leaves their body, and they arrive in the depths of the earth in this dark and dismal place. And the Bible specifically uses it in a way it describes the discomfort that exists there And it's a place where the souls of people who don't respond to God await their final judgment. And so that's what it's described as. And Jesus is saying, if you keep ignoring me, I'm mourning your fate. Because this is where your spirit will arrive awaiting my judgment, which will be more strict than Sodom and Tyre and Sidon's someday. And Jesus says this to try to wake the people up and get their attention, right? Because if somebody's completely disinterested, what can you do? What can you do to get their attention? Sometimes for us, we can't do anything. Jesus, he seems to always have the right thing to say, and he knows where people's limits are. He knows what the needs of their hearts are. And so he says this to wake people up. They think they're so wise, but they're headed for destruction, and they need to reevaluate themselves. It's not just because of where they're headed. 
It's really what they're missing out on here and now that Jesus also wants to awaken them for. They're missing out on what they could be experiencing through a life with Jesus. He is relevant and he is necessary and he will improve their experience on earth. They just don't realize it. And so the last bit of what we're talking about today is Jesus explaining that to the people. I am relevant in your life. And before we get into those final verses, I think it's good to just stop and kind of remember where we've been today and to look at our own lives. What has our response to Jesus been like? And I mean, maybe we have some good reasons. I have friends who have had very painful experiences with different religions in the past. And for that reason, uh, they will never walk into church probably the rest of their life. Maybe they're disinterested in God because people have told them things about God that aren't accurate, and so they're viewing him wrong. Or they've had bad experiences with people who claim to know God, and they're like, I don't want any part of that. But as you get to know Jesus for who he truly is, and reading Gospels like Matthew in the Bible is a great way to get acquainted with him. But as you see Jesus for who he really is, Jesus is saying, you know, I'm, I'm someone worth responding to. I am relevant, and it will improve the way that your life is here on earth. And so I want you to reevaluate things because if these towns, they saw a piece of Jesus, they saw Jesus and they saw different things he was doing and they, they were unresponsive and Jesus was concerned about their future. Maybe he's concerned about our future as well if we've just sort of been uh, very complacent or even critical of Jesus in our life up to this point. So part of it's relevant for us perhaps too to kind of look at ourselves in the mirror and say who am i in this story who am i in this picture and also what can i see about jesus and about god i want to finish by talking about jesus relevance this morning it says at that time so right at the end of saying those things jesus shifts gears he says i praise you father lord of heaven and earth because you've hidden these things from the wise and the educated and revealed them to infants Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. Another thing about these towns in Galilee, Galilee was a hub for the Jewish religious elite. They called themselves Pharisees. There were about 6,000 people who followed more regulations to be kind of like qualified to be a Pharisee in the Jewish faith. And a lot of them were camped out around the Sea of Galilee in these different villages. So very, very committed Jewish people had lots of religious traditions, had lots of education in the Old Testament scriptures as well. And they thought they had all the answers. And yet they were some of the ones that were the most critical of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you've hidden these things, the truths about who Jesus really is, and the power of God being revealed through these miracles daily in their midst. You seem to have hidden these things from the wise and the educated people, the religious leaders who thought they had all the answers probably. And this one thing it tells us is that no amount of education ever guarantees that we're going to know God or see his importance in our lives. So you can give somebody all the education that you want, and that's not necessarily the thing that's going to do it. I think that we can't, God does reveal truths about himself, and we can learn more about God. But let's say you have a friend, and your heart really goes out for that friend to also want to know Jesus and follow Jesus. You can share all the right information. But even having all the right information doesn't guarantee that somebody will be interested in Jesus. And so he's explaining some of these bigger principles before he talks about how relevant he is. But he says at the same time, you've revealed them to infants. Uh, Not necessarily babies that are six months old, but people who spiritually are a lot less mature. The tax collectors, the sinful people who were following him who said, man, this guy's doing these miracles. There must be something going on here. Look at the things he's teaching. I've never heard words like this. He seems to have the authority of God. This is amazing. The people who didn't have all the answers were the people who were gravitating toward Jesus. And Jesus says, isn't that ironic? He says, Father, this was your good pleasure. God actually enjoys giving glimpses of himself to people who are helpless and needy who don't think they have all the answers. Because a lot of things in God's kingdom are upside down. The people that this world prizes and lifts up and looks up to and celebrity, uh, the celebrity aspect, those are not necessarily the people who are uh, in Jesus' kingdom doing what's pleasing to him. Just because you have money, it doesn't mean that you're not following the Lord, for example, or something like that. But the way that this world trends toward very much selfishness, is the opposite of the way God's kingdom works. The people who get swept under the rug in this world because they're not important or they're not a part of the right group or they they act different, those are the people that Jesus embraces and the people that are really quick to embrace Jesus oftentimes 
Isn't it ironic? Verse 27, all things have been entrusted to me, Jesus says, by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, speaking of himself, and anyone to whom the Son or Jesus desires to reveal him. A couple things here. We're talking about learning a little more about God. What is God like? Jesus and the Father, according to what he says here, they exceed our imagination. Nobody can completely wrap their mind around God. God's given us, I think, what we need to know for here and now, but we really don't know God completely. And we probably could spend all of an eternity trying to get to know God and not fully wrap our minds around his entirety and who he is. So you can always learn more and get to know God better uh, throughout you know, all, all life and all time and eternity because he's beyond us. And the only way we can thoroughly become acquainted with God is by Jesus allowing us to, revealing himself to us. And so um, there's an aspect of God reaching out to us as well and showing us more and more about who he is. And so it's complicated. People's disinterest is a complicated thing. It's not something that you can force. And it's something really, truly that, that God, I think, tries to prompt people toward. And yet people can still, you know, reject even what God tries to reveal to people about himself. So it's complex. But then at the same time, it's easy because people who have no spiritual education or qualification can understand the basic things that they need to know about God, the infants, so to speak, spiritually. Finally, Jesus rests on uh, how he makes our lives better. How is he relevant? He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So, weary and burdened. Um, people who are exhausted by life. And maybe you feel like you're just exhausted by life. Or struggles that you face. Or traumatic experiences you've had. Or uh, trials. Or uh, any kinds of things. You know, a number of things that have kind of hit you in life. You're exhausted. But also when it talks about burden, Jesus is talking about the religious burdens. There were so many requirements to be a Jew and to be respected as a Jew in their society. They expected you to follow so many rules and even things that weren't based out of the Old Testament. Rules that they kind of came up with. And so it's like, here's some rules and here's some more that we think would be good for you to follow. And if you can keep all these rules, you might be considered uh, someone who belongs in our religious culture in that day. And so people had so many requirements pressing down on them from every angle. And they're like, like, following God was just burdensome because they'd been told the wrong things about God and about following him and how to approach that. So Jesus says, if you're weary and if you feel like the religious requirements that have been put on you are too much, come to me and I'll show you what rest is like. I'm going to take all that off. I'm going to share things. I'm going to shed things from you. I want to make your life easier. Some of you haven't had an easy life as a follower of Jesus. And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy in the fact that there won't be any suffering or any trials. But all these burdens, they get distributed. The next thing Jesus says is, all of you, take up my yoke. We haven't gotten into any yokes today because yokes are used for teams of horses and oxen. And today most people use tractors, right? So this is kind of archaic as far as the terminology, but the picture is really cool. So a yoke is just a harness that's put around a, a horse, a donkey, an ox, a plowing animal. And so if you team animals up, you have a team of horses or a team of oxen who all of these harnesses on. And if you're plowing a field and you harness a couple of animals together, then they both share the load and the weight of whatever implement they're pulling behind them. And Jesus doesn't just say, get in the yoke with me. He says, all of you take up my yoke. So all of you, uh, he wants everyone who follows him to jump into the yoke. And so this is a burden now that's spread out among millions of people worldwide who are followers of Jesus. And certainly within local communities that we call churches, it's a family thing. And so we're all bearing each other's load and each other's burdens and not alone. Jesus is right there with us, walking with us as we go through these, these things too. We've had people in our church experience some just horrendous health issues and surgical complications and death of family members, even their own kids in the last few months. I mean, lots of hard things. And you don't always have the words to say to someone like that. You can't make something go away. You can't say the right thing, but you can be present with someone and you can help take on the load of caring for those people as they walk through those circumstances. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. And that's one way that we find rest 
He takes the weight of our burdens, each of our burdens as we experience them, and he spreads it out among everyone in his kingdom. And specifically in these local churches, among people in the local church families, and we care for each other. And so life is easier because we all share the burden. We're all hooked up together and harnessed with Jesus. Next, he says, learn from me. And the way that you would teach a less experienced animal how to plow, you just put them in the same harness or yoke with a more experienced animal, and they'll, they'll take them through the ropes, right? And after a thousand times going through the same pattern in the field, you know, even if you're a donkey, you kind of get the idea. This is what we do to plow the field, right? We do this thing, and you've learned it from example. And Jesus is saying, if you team up with me, I will teach you how to navigate life, and you'll be able to avoid some of the pitfalls that you fell into in the past. So walk with me, and I'll point out the problem areas. I'll get your attention. And I'll guide you as we walk through life together. He says, because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And so some teachers, I don't know if you've ever had interesting teachers in your lives, maybe elementary school or high school or a college professor, but somebody who was maybe less than gracious toward you. Very strict, required a lot of things, very much a disciplinarian, you know, author authoritarian kind of person who said, this is my way, and if you want to survive this class, you're going to do it my way. And it was tough to get through it. Jesus is not that kind of teacher. He says, I'm gentle and I'm humble I'm careful with you, and I understand your shortcomings. Uh, and I don't think, you know, I'm this, I'm not going to act like this high and mighty person, which is God in the flesh, he'd be entitled to. I'm going to treat you uh, as if I'm serving you in this process. I'm going to be patient with you as we walk through it together. And he says, you'll find rest for yourselves. And it's actually rest for your souls. Uh, an inner rest that you experience on an emotional and a psychological level. That's where you're going to find for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he says, even if life gets chaotic, you're going to have this peace that you don't quite understand, you can't quite wrap your mind around, that's going to walk with you and kind of cover your soul, soothe your soul as you go through all these things. And so, really, <laughs> if you want your life to be something that's better, something that's more enjoyable, that's easier than doing it yourself and pursuing everything that you think is great in life, you need to connect with me and get into my yoke because it'll be lighter for all those reasons. Um, you need to realize that, that I really do care, that I really do want to enhance your life, make it better in so many ways. And so that's the thought from today. The overall picture is Jesus is speaking to people who have rejected him, who see him as irrelevant. You know, they're not responsive. And Jesus says, first of all, you know, Take an honest look at me and the way that I'm acting and what I'm doing. And, and when you see my motives and you see my approach, maybe you need to rethink your assessment. Also, if you think I'm playing kids games, there's more to it than that. First of all, I'm grieving your future path because I'm offering you something. And if you don't turn to that, I see where it's going to take you. But also, I'm incredibly relevant. And I have this ability to, to lessen the burdens and improve your life every step of the way if you could only see it. And so it's his heart just kind of bleeding for the people in these towns to recognize him. But ultimately, it's left up to them. And ultimately, it's left up to us. What are we going to do with Jesus and how are we going to respond? And that's really the message, I think, from Jesus to us today. Let's go ahead and pray together. God, I thank you for taking us into your heart this morning and just showing us, I think, how how you grieve the way that we ignore you so often in life. And maybe we just get sidetracked for a while, we're following you and then we get caught up in ourselves or distracted with other things or uh, pulled aside by some habit or addiction or something that you know just gets a hold of us for a season and then we come back to you. Or maybe we've just been really skeptical of you in the first place our entire lives. How in the world would Jesus ever improve my life? You know, why, why should I pay attention to him? And I pray that through just your honest, heartfelt comments, there might be something in that for us today that would get our attention or speak to us or even draw us to yourself so that you can uh, allow our lives to be a better experience, an easier experience where we're not shouldering all these burdens ourselves and we have a community of people surrounding us and a loving teacher right next to us being you who's walking us through this course of life and gives us hope beyond. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.